name is David McClellan. I'm a senior scientist at Bigelow Laboratory. Uh, and uh, so let me first uh, kind of describe what uh, uh, Cafe Scientifique is all about for those that may not have been here before. Um, it's a, just a public forum. Our scientists and visiting guests will present a, uh, uh, a lecture or, or a seminar, it's kind of what we call these, uh, that uh, hopefully you'll find interesting. Uh, please, uh, please ask questions anytime. Uh, if you have one, just raise your hand and we'll uh, hopefully uh, see it. You know, if you need to, just wave your arm around. Um, very informal. Uh, there will be a, a Q and A after the after the talk is over. Um, we're planning on finishing around 7 p.m. So, um, as you may have seen, there's uh, drinks uh, available in the back, uh, and uh, it's always a highlight for people. Uh, so, if you haven't already, uh, please sign our guest book, uh, and. Uh, you know, we'll uh, hopefully uh, be in communication with you. We, we have a, a monthly uh, newsletter so you can keep track of what we're doing. And, and uh, so you, if you're interested, please uh, uh, sign in uh, and help yourself to the materials there. Um, so next week, so we'll be doing this every week. Uh, you'll see that there's a schedule over there. Next week, uh, uh, two of our senior scientists, uh, Dr. Wansun, uh, Wansu Yoon and uh, Willie Wilson, will be discussing the discovery of uh, the ocean's smallest predators. And uh, it's actually been uh, published in the uh, preeminent uh, science journal here in the United States, the magazine Science. And uh, a very nice article on it. Ready. So this week we have Dr. Cindy Heil, also a senior scientist at Bigelow, and uh, her talk is entitled, And the Sea Turned to Blood. I'm guessing that that's a biblical uh, yep. reference. Red tides, harmful algae, and toxic phytoplankton. Now, Cindy, I'm supposed to introduce her too, so I get to brag about her a little bit. So Cindy uh, joined Bigelow Laboratory and, um, just uh, recently, in uh, November of last year. Um, so she got her uh, PhD from uh, the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island in 1996 for her research on the nutrition of different types of harmful, harmful microalgae. Uh, she did a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at University of Queensland in Brisbane, uh, Australia. Brisbane. Sorry, Brisbane. Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> I was when I showed up and they said American. <laughs> well, that's okay, because I'm an American, so it's Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> where she worked on the development of new methods of using marine plants to assess water quality. Very cool. Um, so uh, from there, she uh, Returned to, returned to Florida uh, to oversee a five-year multi-investigator grant on Florida Red Tide at the University of South Florida uh, College of, of Marine Science. And uh, then she, she basically ran the, the program for Red Tide in the state of Florida for a while. Um, what, seven years? Yeah, seven years. Seven years. Um, now she's with us and her research focuses on harmful algae, uh, nutrients, and water quality with projects ranging from the effects of nutrients on toxin production to the impacts of Everglade restoration on coastal algal blooms. Dr. Hyland. Oh. oh, I've been holding them. I thought I had a new Subaru. <laughs> uh, we got some Subaru keys here. It looks like it's a Bigelow employee because it looks like the front door of our building. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, all right. Thanks. Got a tanker. I thought I got a new suit. It's not new. Well, bless you guys all that beer. Wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm on. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. I'm glad to 
see you all have beers in your hand, because i got to tell you, if you're expecting dry May humor, you're two days early for Tim Sample. <laughs> you're going to hear about red tides instead. Uh, or as the scientific word now is harmful algal bloom, or half. And I might slip into jargon. If I do, you know, raise your hand, and I'll try and slip back out of it. And as David said, if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand. If I see you or David sees you, I don't mind being interrupted. And if you got a question while I go through, sometimes that's the best time to to, answer, to ask it. I don't guarantee I'll have the answers, but we'll see. I put this quote as the title because I wanted to remind everybody, even though red tide is one of the current environmental challenges or global issues that we face right now, it's a very old problem. This is a quote from the Bible, and I probably should have had a parenthesis with the Bible <laughs> down. I apologize for that. Red tides have been around for a long time. It's only really recently that they've gotten a lot of attention, though, scientifically. They're a lot older than the Bible. In fact, if you look at the geological record, they go back hundreds of millions of years. So it's not a new issue, but if you're like this, which was my Florida apartment building five years ago, and you have that, those are dead fish from a red tide, in your backyard, it's a very personal issue. I bought a cot and spent the week at work for this. Um, our Florida red tide kills fish, unlike the main red tide, and this is a perfect example of it. Um, a little bit of a roadmap. I'm going to give you a lot of background information on red tide and halves, and then go a little bit onto the science, particularly my science right now, which is focusing on eutrophication, nutrient pollution, and links with red tides. And then go into a little bit, when I was in Florida, my group was responsible for investigating what we call UMEs, U-M-M-E, unusual marine mortality events, if we thought there was red tide in that And I want to tell you the story in 2002, when we had a, an UMI with manatees. We lost about 200 manatees, and it turned out it was linked to red tide. And I'll give you a little bit of the detective story of that. So starting from the very general, what is red tide? Well, most of them aren't red, and they got nothing to do with tides. We're talking about a harmful algal bloom. These can be just about any color under the sun. Oftentimes, they're not even colored. The main red tide, you won't even know what's there, but water just looks like normal. Concentrations are very low. Some in the upper right is the Florida red tide. You know when it's there and concentrated. The water kind of turns a sickly brown. Sometimes it's red. Sometimes it's green. This is fresh water. You've seen the green muck in fresh water. That's probably algae. I have. Harmful algae bloom. About 50% of them are toxic. So if you actually see that, don't let your dog know. Mm -hmm. So red tides, they're not all red. <laughs> Nothing to do with tides. In fact, some of them are actually fluorescent. Uh, phosphorescent. And this is an example of two species we've worked with. But this is actually the surf off California in the bottom, a bloom of the dinoflagellate lingladinium. Oh, it's beautiful. This is just a wave cresting on the beach, and you got organisms out there um, glowing like fireflies. And then in the upper right is an entirely different type of red tide dinoflagellate, pyridinium. And this is Phosphorescence Bay in Puerto Rico. If you've ever been there, it's an actual tourist attraction. You go out and they guide you through kayaking at night in the Phosphorescent Bay. They let you swim. It's not, that one is not toxic, but it's absolutely beautiful if you've ever done it. Um, okay, halves, red tides, phytoplankton, what are we talking about? If you've come to these regularly, you know at Bigelow we study phytoplankton. Depending on who you talk to, there's anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 species of phytoplankton globally. 10,000 if you're an ecologist like me who doesn't want to identify phytoplankton, and 100,000 if that's what you do. Um, <laughs> you're a taxonomist. If I can safely say that, because I don't think there are any taxonomists here. Um, of these 10,000 to 100,000 species, approximately 30, 300 form what we call blooms. And that's when you get one or two species that dominate. And they can do this for a variety of reasons. It can be the right chemical environment, it can, uh, the right nutrients, it can be the right light. Um, it can be just a natural cycle in the coastal algae. Um, of these 300 species, 100 contain toxins. And that can impact you, that can impact marine mammals, that can impact shellfish economies, it kind of ripples through um, coastal cultures in many areas. We don't know why they're toxic. There's a lot of theories bumping around right now. Uh, it may be a defense against being eaten. It may be a way to store nutrients. Some of these toxins have nitrogen in them. It may simply be just a function of the biochemistry of the cell. They do this and they don't particularly care that they're toxic. If it happens to be a uh, you know, a, a fish swimming by with a red tide, then you do care. So we don't know why they're toxic. And then locally, 
In Maine, there's probably 15 species of harmful algae that we need to be concerned about. One in particular, Alexandria, which I'm going to talk about, which is the biggie here. This is the one that can actually kill you. And I put Florida here because I've been in Florida for the last seven, eight years, and I know a lot about Florida, and a lot of my slides are from Florida. So we have over 70 species that we routinely monitor for. We have a very long coastline, and we have a lot of problems with red tide. We get it every year, much like Maine does. Okay, what makes an algal bloom harmful? Well, a lot of people think of toxin production. That's true. I said a subset of 100 are toxic. These can be very potent toxins. Saxitoxin, for example, is about 50 times as potent as curare. It's about 1,000 times more potent than sarin gas. You're talking about a very heavy-duty toxin here. Um, you can see a few of the structures up there. Some are fairly simple, some are fairly complex. Uh, and that's why it's kind of interesting why these things produce these, because, you know, producing something like this is not an easy task if you're an algae. It has to have a reason for doing it. Um, other harmful algae, or, or halves, uh, cause water discoloration and light attenuation. If you're a seagrass, this is the kind you don't want to see. A lot of algae in the water cut blocking off the light. And I've two examples here from cruises, one without a red tide and one with a red tide. This is an instrument called a CTD, conductivity temperature depth, we put over the side. And on the left, it's fairly clear water. On the right, you see the green water, and you can understand why the light is blocked. Uh, low dissolved oxygen. Some species don't have toxins, but if you get enough of them, um, when they photosynthesize and respire, they can draw down the oxygen. If you've heard about the Z zone off the Mississippi, this is an example of a low dissolved oxygen, anoxia, hypoxia, or dead zone. Um, there are other mechanisms, not very common, thank, thank you, called am like ambush predation. Uh, this is a half species that actually lives in the sediment until a fish swims by, and some of the nitrogen compounds of fish excretes stimulate this, and it actually will attack the fish and start consuming the scales. It's called an ambush predator. So it's actually a plant eating a fish, believe it or not. Wow. And it has a flagella, so it's a swimming plant eating a swimming fish. And the last is physical irritation. Some of these species are perfectly harmless, except they got spines. And if you're a salmon running through a bloom of this, your gills are going to get pretty chopped up. So there's been some, some um, aquaculture issues with some of these very spiny species. So it's not just toxins. There's a whole variety of things that make a bloom harmful. Are you safe anywhere? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I put this up, and this is when I get the questions about, okay, what about this town here? Um, in Maine, we're primarily concerned with Alexandria, and there are other species, but that is the big one. That's the one they regulate uh, monitor shellfish beds for. We currently are on the tail end of a, an Alexandrian red tide in Maine. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico, we have Karenia, which is a different organ with a different toxin. But pretty much everywhere you go, there's a different type of red tide. Something to be aware of, all red tides are not the same. Uh, this is something we dealt with in Florida. We had a lot of, uh, let's see, tourists come in who knew about Maine red tide, didn't know about Florida red tide. Um, the Maine red tide doesn't just color the water, but if you get a toxic shellfish, it can kill you. The Florida one won't kill you, it'll just give you a nasty weekend. Um, but everybody brings their preconceived uh, notions of the red tide that they've experienced with. That's why we've kind of shifted to harmful algae. So a lot of people will get red tide, the term confused, and applying it globally when it's not. You're talking about 300 different species here. But the point being, there's, it's pretty much an, a U.S. problem, freshwater and marine, and a global problem. And if you've got a question about a particular area, I'd be happy to talk with you about the uh, red tide that's going on. Um, I wouldn't cruise in Alaska right now because they're getting slammed with red tide. Actually, it's the same, same genera as here in Maine. Only if you see the coastline, they have a lot of harder time monitoring because they have this huge coastline. The main red tide. Well, we get a lot of questions about this, and it's a species called Alexandria. And there's two different species, actually. That's the genus name. Um, and it causes something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, the toxin is saxitoxin. It's called PSP, paralytic shellfish poisoning, essentially to describe the symptoms. It's a paralytic agent. I'll go into that in a minute. But we've heard of PSP as the shellfish toxins. These shellfish actually eat the cells, consume them, and concentrate the toxins. And that's what the state monitor is for. And I should tell you, it's perfectly safe to go down fishermen's co-op and have clams because the states are very good at monitoring this. However, if you go out to somebody's backyard and eat clams, you're, don't do that. You're, you're, believe me, 
you're taking a risk right now. But um, one of the questions I get, and I'll go into this a little later, is are wounds increasing? And on the top, I've got a map of PSP incidents from 1970, the little red dots, I think if you guys can see it. And on the below, there's, below is the same map from 06. Wow. And you can see a lot more little red dots. Uh, if you look at this and say, yes, it's increasing, and I say, yes, but we're a little better at monitoring it now. So maybe yes, maybe no, although this is pretty conclusive, I think. What you need to know about Alexandrium, uh, normally in the water column, you get these vegetative cells, but it does have a cyst stage, and this is the seed stage in its life cycle. And this is why every year we get red tides, because the cells go through a normal cycle, but they can produce these cysts, and they overwinter. And the next spring, spring there's just like a tulip bulb coming up. They exist, and you'll get a new bloom. So the bad news is, Maine didn't have bad red tides before 72. Joe, Joyce? Cindy, how big are those cysts? Um, 35, 40 microns. Oh, so, Maine didn't have, if you remember, if you lived here a while, there, pre early 70s, there really wasn't a red tide issue. There was actually a hurricane that came through in 72 and carried the blues, which are quite common in the Bay of Fundy down the coast. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't have been an issue, except it existed and dropped a lot of cysts into the sediment. So we've had red tides ever since. Will Alexandria make toxic? No, actually they don't. And that's the interesting thing. You can <coughs> grow up, pick out a cell out of the water and grow it up, and sometimes it's toxic, sometimes it's not. You can actually manipulate the toxicity depending on the conditions. And there's a latitudinal tutorial. <coughs> you get Alexandria in Connecticut, but it's nowhere near as toxic as it is in Maine. <coughs> in the Bay of Fundy, it's hugely toxic. So there's a variety of different things. It can be the natural conditions. It can be just the different genetics, and it can be latitude, too. So you can't just assume it is, although the majority of Alexandria gas is toxic. And the toxin is such as you don't want to play games with it, this particular one. Why does the latitude make a difference? We don't know. To tell you the truth, I wish I did. Um, it could be temperature, because there's some temperature involved in regulating this cycle. As it goes more south, it gets warmer. Um, it may be a function of the fact that there's a bug on the screen. <laughs> That's a first. I was going to say, if the audience with beer and a bug on the screen, um, where was I? It could be a fact that, that they're fairly newer to the south because they were inoculated from this hurricane in the early 70s. So, northern New England, Canada has always had this Alexandria in close. Southern New England, uh, from down into Connecticut, hasn't, at least this species. Uh, what do we know? I mentioned the cyst stage. Uh, the way the state and the federal agencies are monitoring main red tide is right now they actually go out and look at the cyst concentrations in the sediments. And these are actual maps of where the cysts of red tide are. And it's interesting because you see there's two hot spots, Casco Bay here and then up near the Bay of Fundy. And what you think is happening with this species come June is the time it shows up around this area. We think it's getting inoculated from these two populations here and up here, and the coastal currents, the eastern main coastal current and western main, carry these blooms further south and inoculate the coastal waters. <coughs> so you'll get a bloom up here, toxicity, before you get it down here. So they've gotten very good at predicting when the local waters are going to be toxic. And I mentioned PSP, paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, first of all, this is a toxin that you can get clams and you can boil them, the toxin is still there. You can't get rid of it. So if you have any doubt, don't, don't, don't consume the clams. But that being said, the shellfish that you eat, for example, at Robinson's Wharf is safe. That is inspected and monitored. I just put up some of the symptoms here so you're aware of them. Um, probably the most characteristic is the numbness, numbness and the tingling of the, the arms and the legs. Uh, and in severe cases, it is paralysis, you have difficulty breathing, they put you on an iron lung, and there are people that die from this. Question? Uh -huh. uh, so the uh, structure of those toxins, it's energetically expensive for people to make them. Uh, it doesn't prevent them from being eaten. What uh, function well, does it serve in their life cycle? That's the question. So that's the toxin here. Has You see there's a nitrogen, 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 nitrogen. I think it might be a way for the cell to store nitrogen and they can produce these compounds and store them away. They become more and more toxic, but the cells, you know, it, it, 
they're not affected by the toxins. So it may be a way that they, they're just able to store nutrients. And the fact that it's toxic is irrelevant to the cell itself. It's, it's stored and not secreted? No, it's stored. Yeah, uh, other toxins, um, when the algae die, they're actually dissolved into the water. And that's an issue in Florida. As the blooms get older and cells die, go through this life cycle, we get a lot more dissolved toxins in the water and the blooms become much more toxic. Um, that's less of a factor here in Maine. Just a little bit on Florida red tides. We got a lot of residents going back and forth. And plus, this, is, this was my, <coughs> my home red tide for a long time. It's a different species. If you remember, the last one was kind of spiny. This is what we call a naked dinoflagellate. It doesn't have those plates. Um, it swims about a foot, a foot an hour. It's mobile. Our Florida red tides, as I said, they're not going to kill you, but they're going to give you a really bad weekend if you eat the shellfish. Um, the difference, though, is they do discolor the water. You can see the green bands here and in the horizon. That's a red tide in Florida. And they're fish killers. Uh, and sometimes there are hundreds of millions of fish. The worst one ever recorded in 47, the estimates were close to two or three billion fish died from red tide. And if you think about it, that's a lot of fish in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's everything from schooling fish, here the mullet, the smaller fish, to a glide grouper. This was a ATV, and this fish was literally a four foot long, huge thing. And it does directly impact manatees, dolphins, higher trophic levels. These are, our agency was responsible for monitoring manatees. So this was the least gruesome photo I could find for you. Um, and the other impact, which is unique to this one, if you're ever in Florida, in Florida, you're at the beach, we call it the red tide tickle. The cells break up in the surf and are aerosolized. So you're actually breathing red tide toxins in Florida at the beach and people will cough in. Um, and usually it's not a problem. We tell people to go to another beach, but during bad red tides, that whole circle is red tide, so there's no other beach. So it's a huge economy drain to Florida, uh, much more than it is to Maine, because Florida does not have a state tax, and they rely almost entirely on tourism dollars. And when you have a red tide like this, we don't get tourists. Um, I mentioned this causes a different syndrome, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Uh, probably the most unique thing, characteristic here, is a reversal of hot and cold sensations. This is how you know you've eaten a bad clam. You touch an ice cube, it feels like you're touching the burner on the stove, which is very unique. The good news is the states do a very good job of monitoring. The bad news is we have a lot of transient populations that don't know about the red tide. In Florida, it's tourists who rent a condo on the beach in Fort Myers, and they pay $1,000 for their week, and they're going to eat that coquina on the beach. And they have no idea what red tide is until they get very sick or the, the recent immigrants who don't speak English and don't see the signs. And in Maine, it's, it's largely misinformation. You'll get somebody sailing offshore who is not thinking red tide and say, oh, let's cook up some plants for dinner, and it happens to be a toxic area. So we still do get incidents of NSP and PSP. Um, no recent fatalities, although there have been PSP fatalities in the Pacific just about every year. This is a question I get a lot. Um, in fact, the first question I get, are harmful algae the red tide rule is increasing? And in some areas, yes. And I, this is an old, old data set. These are 1976 to 86, but it's so graphic I wanted to put it up. And simply, the bars are actually the population numbers, and the dots are the number of red tides in a year. And this is Hong Kong Harbor. And you see, you get more population, you get more red tides. Um, this was published in 89, and it's an interesting story because the Hong Kong government saw this graph and went, no, no, we have to end this. And what they did is all the sewage and effluent pipes that went into Hong Kong Bay, they moved up the coast 10 miles. <laughs> <laughs> and this graph immediately kind of went like that. And they got up and said, what a great success story. And the scientists were like, ah, uh, wait a minute, what's happening 10 miles up the coast? And they're like, oh, we don't monitor there. <laughs> so... Yes, in some areas there's very clear evidence that these blooms are increasing. Uh, in other areas, eh, maybe yes, maybe no. And this is the problem in Florida. We have a very long record. This is actually it's sort of spotty, 1878. It picks up about it. 1948 because the, the actual organism was identified. Um, and then continues annually through 2010. It's simply the number of months a year when we had red tide in state waters. And you look for a pattern in that, and it's like, no. We had good years, we had bad years. 
but it's hard to see a pattern. It's just a natural feature of our system down there. So some cases, yes, we're getting more. Other cases, can't really tell. Well, of the ones that are increasing, why? And the first culprit everybody points to is eutrophication. And if you've never heard that word, it simply means nutrient over enrichment of coastal waters. When you're talking more nutrients into water, you get more nutrients, you get more algae. In the case of red tides, those nutrients can actually select for certain types of algae, red tide algae. But some people call it nutrient pollution. That being said, there are other reasons, possibly. Uh, we're seeing more aquaculture operations globally. Um, fish pens, fish, uh, fish aquaculture is actually a very nutrient intense process. They feed the fish and a lot of the nutrients actually are wasted and they promote red tides in the areas around these pens. Uh, transport via ballast water and shellfish seeding activities. This one's kind of interesting. Um, in 89, I was called to do some consulting work in Kuwait. They had their first red tide. This was before the first, first war there, and they suspected it was related to Florida red tide, so I got the call, I'm like, yeah, oh, this would be interesting. It freaked my mother out, but <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I want to go to Kuwait. And we got there, and it was interesting because it was a Corinthian species, but it was one that only bloomed in the Gulf of Mexico and New Zealand. And it wasn't the main Corinthian species, it was something called Corinthia celliformis. And we were puzzled, it's like, why if it's blooming in New Zealand and it's blooming in the US and the Gulf, why the heck is it showing up in Kuwait Bay? And they have an incredible nutrient pollution problem, pipes just going in, they just started aquaculture. At the time, Saddam was basically paving the marshes in south, southern Iraq, and it was one big effluent tube from Iraq to Iraq, or excuse me, Iraq down into Kuwait Bay. The last day, though, I was talking to one of the ministers, and I was explaining that this is just weird. Why is it in New Zealand, and why is it in the U.S., and why is it in Kuwait? And he looked at me and says, did you know that most of the land from the Middle East comes from New Zealand? And this little light bulb kind of went, bing. It's like, ah, ballast water. And they ship it live. So you have a lot of tankers with live lamb. They take on ballast water in New Zealand, and they go directly to Kuwait. So we don't have evidence for sure, but we really suspect that this was the mode of transport. And Kuwait's had these red tides ever since. Um, there's also other reasons, a little harder to pin down. Climate change, definitely an issue. You increase the temperature, you increase the range of some of these. You change the currents, you move them around. Uh, improved scientific methodology and monitoring. And that's why I was a little hesitant about that graph of all the map of all the dot points. Simply because 20 years ago, nobody was really interested in red tide and nobody was funding the research. And it drives a lot of the research now. There's a lot of federal money being spent on studying red tide and how to mitigate it and how to deal with it. And when that happens, you get a lot more people looking for it than you ever had before. So it's possible, you know, there's more people looking for it. We're getting better at finding it. So it's kind of hard to pick out what's an actual increase from just, you know, doing our jobs better. And then the normal shifting currents and natural dispersal mechanism. I was going to focus on eutrophication. It's what we call, um, relates back to nutrients and bottom-up control of blooms. When we say bottom-up, we mean essentially the nutrients that feed the blooms. And this is compared to tops down, which is actually the bloom being controlled by things that are eating it. With a lot of red tides, so we strongly suspect that it's a bottom-up nutrient enrichment issue. Um, I left some projects in Florida, a big five-year grant, and it was hard for us to summarize it, and I thought I could do it in one slide. <laughs> this is actually a Florida red tide, my stylized red tide. What we were doing, this is a NOAA grant, was looking at all the different possible nutrient sources for red tide, trying to quantify them to see which ones we could actually control. And there's some obvious ones. This is eutrophication, the estuary discharge, the normal nutrients. If you're on a condo on a beach in Florida, this is the one you're aware of. But there are other ones that you're not. Zooplankton so grazing and excretion, the smaller shrimp-like organisms, nutrients from the bottom, nutrients from deep water, atmospheric inputs. There's enough uh, smog in Florida that you can actually quantify that. Uh, other organisms, and this I'll get into in a minute, nitrogen fixation. This is a type of cyanobacteria called trichodesmium, which if you're a sailor, you know a sea sawdust in tropical, subtropical waters. It's kind of a brown sawdust on the surface. It's unique because it doesn't need the normal nutrients. It fixes nitrogen gas. And this is important because it's found globally 
in the circuit, the equatorial band, and it's so good at fixing this nitrogen gas into ammonia that it excretes a lot. And if you look at the Florida record, every year for the last 50 years, when you get a bloom, right before it, we have a bloom of this. So it had us kind of suspicious that there was a connection there. And then the most surprising one, dead fish, or actually a quantifiable nutrient source. So five years of research, right there. Uh, <laughs> some things are minor sources, believe it or not. The nutrient pollution for Florida River tides, all these blooms actually start offshore out of this nutrient pollution and grazing. The bottom surprised us because that's a significant source. Nitrogen fixation is, but the number one source is these dead fish. And it's actually referred to as fish farming by, by red tide right now in Florida. It's thought that the toxins in this case were developed to kill the fish, and as the fish decay, they put more nutrients in the water, and the waters are what we call oligotrophic. There aren't a lot of natural nutrients. So these blooms are actually farming themselves. I'm gonna just focus a little bit on this. This is kind of oversimplifying it, so I wanted to focus on this to give you some idea of the complexity. This one relationship here, we were looking at, we call it the red dust, red tide theory. And I mentioned there was a link between this nitrogen gas fixing organism and perennial red tides. What we found is these bloom April, May in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's coincident with dust coming over from the Sahara, which has you scratch on your head if you don't know the connection. The enzyme that allows it to fix nitrogen has a huge iron requirement. And the Gulf of Mexico is very iron limited. There's not a lot of iron. And the only iron really coming in is in the spring when these Saharan dust storms are whipped up and they cross the Atlantic and they add dump into the Gulf of Mexico. And you can actually see them. There's an atmospheric chemist at the University of Miami that sends out an email every day saying, there's dust on the windshield. It's here. It's here. And it gives you the daily dust on the windshield report. But this dust is very rich in iron. And as soon as we get those dust inputs, we get blown from trichodesmium, and a month later we see, we see the nutrients rise and then we get red tide. So just one of those little circles is very complex. And you can see kind of why there's issues with studying these. This took a team of physical, chemical, and biological oceanographers about 10 years to figure out. One of my research focuses right now is on the bowl of urea in here. And you may or may not have heard of urea. Uh, it's a fairly simple compound. I put it up over there, two ammonias and a carbon. And the reason we're interested in it scientifically is we've recently identified a trend globally with fertilizers. They're shifting from nitrate to urea. You can see you get two ammonias for the price of one. It's fairly easy to produce. If you look at blueberries and potatoes in Maine, they're primarily fertilized with urea now. And there's been this trend in the last 20 years to use urea. Uh, if you go into Lowe's and look at a fertilizer bag, 10 to 1 it's going to say urea as the nitrogen source. Uh, it's in slow release fertilizers. We know that it's being mobilized in the coastal waters. I know it is in Florida. We don't know if it's being mobilized in the main waters, and this is the subject of Kai, who's the third one in there waving her hand, mm -hmm. and our EU intern at Bigelow. She's measuring that this summer to see if it's significant. But why do we care? Red tides and halves love urea. And it may be one of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in these blooms. This is simply a water sample from a red tide in Florida. And we fed it two different types of inorganic nutrients, nit ammonia and nitrate, and then urea and glutamine and alanine, some complex. And looking at this, your eye goes right here. It likes urea. So if we're mobilizing all these fertilizers in the coastal waters, we may be selecting for these red tides. And the question is, we know Alexandria in Maine can, in Maine can use it. It's been shown to take these up. We just don't know. The last measurements were made 25 years ago by another big little scientist. There haven't been any measurements since, so that's why we're interested in seeing if it's a problem now. Um, Question. Yep. Is nitrogen uptake um, completely related to cell growth and reproduction? Um, it's more physiological state. Yeah, to divide, they need to take up nitrogen. Um, Different types of algae will take up different forms of nitrogen. Some can take, some prefer different forms. It's turning out all of these red tide species prefer urea. They prefer these complex organic nitrogen sources that the diatoms, the good guys, simply aren't interested in. So by shifting the forms of nitrogen, we may be shifting the types of algae that are responding to this nitrogen. 
But algae require nitrogen at all times, basically. They will take up whatever they can get that their uptake uh, channels can utilize, which is kind of a complex answer, and I think I, I got what you were interested in. I mentioned before that our group in Florida was, we monitor red tide in Florida. This means we put our maps where it was, we monitored the shellfish beds, provided the data to open and close the beds, and we were tasked with investigating boomies, unusual marine mortality events. And this included manatees, which are very, if you've never seen a manatee, they are incredibly cute, very, very vulnerable, and very, very large animals. Um, in Florida, we only have about 3,200 of them. And this was from a high count, round one. So we don't have a lot of them. We can't afford to lose them. Uh, manatees die each year from frostbite, believe it or not, cold shock. In the winter months, they go up into the warm springs. They don't like the cold weather, even in Florida it gets cold. Um, they go up into the thermal effluent from the power plants and over winter, they don't eat. And then in the spring, they come out and, and basically come barreling down these estuaries to eat seagrass. Uh, most manatees, let's see, most years we lose a lot from cold shock. We lose quite a bit from boats. Uh, propellers, uh, but we intermittently lose a lot from red tide, too. And it, before 2002, it was kind of a mystery. We didn't know why. We thought they were impacted by, like, people breathing their, they can't get out of the water. They're breathing toxins in all the time. Um, but we've got these huge manatee mortality events, but they were only from February to April. What happened, and this is just to show you, um, the human respiratory impacts, these are some scientists after a very long cruise where I made them sit on a red tide for two weeks. Um, but it's thought that the manatees have similar <laughs> respiratory impacts. And the good news is that if we could rescue them, if we could get them and bring them out of the red tide and like bush gardens and aquariums, we could save most of them. The problems with doing this, however, that's a baby manatee. <laughs> and it's taken five guys and a girl to get them on the boat. And it's probably half the size of a full grown one. So, they're trying to get rescue some of these was very, very difficult. Um, some of these umies were, I think the biggest one was 196 manatee mortalities. And we simply couldn't get to these. These were animals that perished before we could even rescue them. In 2002, we had an, uh, an unusual mortality event. And it was intriguing to us because we had a red tide in the area through the 17th. But then it went away, and a week later, the manatees started dying. And this is a horrendous time, because day one you get a report of one manatee, and the next day there's three, and the next day there's five, and you start to suspect something's very wrong. And uh, they're very tough to deal with. But this one was a mystery, because they were dying when there was no red tide there. We couldn't see the cells. Why 2002 is important, because there was a new way to test for toxins introduced in 2002 called the ELISA. And it's very fast, very quick, it would tell you the brevitoxins there um, very accurately, and you could use it in a variety of different matrices. And what that means is you can use it on water, you can use it on tissue, you can use it on cell level filter, you can use it on human blood if you wanted to. So we had a really quick way to test where these toxins were in the animals to give us some clues. And when we did this, we expected, this is brevitoxins, which is the red tide toxin in the manatee. We expected them to show up in the lung. Because we think they're breathing it like we are, they're going to be infected. And the interesting thing, if you look at the number, it's only 15. The liver is 150. You'd expect that, because the liver is the detoxifying organism. But where we saw all the toxins was in the stomach, which was really intriguing, because these are manatees, they're coming down, they're eating seagrass. Seagrass isn't toxic. Um, a little bit about manatee biology. When you eat dinner, it takes about 24 hours to go through you. If you're a manatee, it takes 13 days to go from one end to the other. So if you're a manatee eating something toxic, it's going to be in your system for two weeks. So this gave us indications that it was something they were eating, but we're puzzling because we're not seeing any cells. So we sent people out and basically said, this is where they're dying, collect the heck out of the area, collect everything you see. So what they did is they went and tested the water, and this is PBTX, this is actually a notation for brevitoxins. Wasn't a lot in the water. There's a little bit more in the sediments. But then you look at the seagrass and it's like, whoa, what the heck is going on? And the short story is the seagrass actually weren't toxic. It was what we call the epiphytes, the community that was living on the seagrass. And we still don't know whether it was actual 
the toxins absorbed into the surface, or it was the community they are eating red tide and storing the toxins. But these poor manatees were essentially overwintering up into the springs, not eating, coming down. First thing they want to do is eat a nice big seagrass meal, and they do, and it's loaded with toxins. Luckily, it doesn't happen every year. Um, most red tides in Florida are in the fall, and by spring we don't see them, so this is why it only happens once every five years or so. The good news is that this allowed the state to essentially target the management manatees. We monitor red tides, so we know if there's going to be a problem, and we you know, have people mobilize volunteers spotting for dead manatees, or actually struggling manatees, we don't want to call them dead manatees, um, although we do recover them. So we developed a monitoring plan to take this into account. It looks at where the red tide is, it looks at where the manatees are, how many, you know, are there more in southern Florida, are there more in the northwest? And we haven't had a severe uh, mortality event since, but this is primarily because of this new method that was invented. Um, the nice thing about this method, this is just data, another way of showing the data, a lot in the liver, a lot in the stomach. We kept the tissue from old manatee mortality events. When they do a necropsy on a manatee, they would freeze the tissue. Necropsy is an animal autopsy. So we could go back into these old tissues from previous events, and it confirmed this. You can see the same pattern of results, and then run the same sort of thing with newer manatee uh, omies. And you can see we're pretty sure now that most of the manatee mortality is by ingestion of seagrass, which was totally unexpected. Second year. <laughs> struggling to have the red tide ecologists talk to the socioeconomic scientists. We're trying to make those connections. There's some data available. This is from a Woods Hole O2 report. These are in um, millions of dollars, $50 million for a single year, 2002. That being said, I know there was a bloom in the 70s in Florida. The, the estimates are $25 million was the cost. So that's a vast underestimate of the economic impacts of these red tides. And it's everything from public health, to the fisheries, to recreation, to the costs of monitoring these. They're not cheap to monitor, especially when you have a long coastline involved. This is something, actually, we're still working on, to tell you the truth. There are upcoming workshops on exactly how to do this. So we don't know an exact number. We just know they're expensive. And I was going to close out with the other question I get all the time, so what, what can we do about red tides? Can we mitigate them? Um, that's a tricky question. Uh, in many cases, these are natural phenomena. And probably the first rule is do no harm, or do no more harm than what the red tide is doing. <laughs> so it's got to be ecologically sound, logically practical, and economically feasible. And the point is, it's fairly easy to kill these cells. You can do it by just putting bleach in. In fact, there's a guy in Florida, a retired guy, that patented bleach as a cure for red tide. I don't know how he did that. He kept the portal a secret for years. And he actually got a patent. We looked at this and we're like, it's bleach. What the heck? Um, but it does kill the cells. The problem is the toxins go into the water and they become more toxic. That being said, people have been trying to mitigate these blooms for a long time. Copper sulfate, believe it or not, this is one of, one of the littlest known ecological disaster stories in the U.S. In the 50s, when they first cultured the bug, for some reason somebody added copper and it died. And everybody went, oh, this is how we get rid of red tide. And they literally dumped tons of copper sulfate on a red tide bloom off St. Petersburg, Florida. They were dropping it from airplanes and off the back of boats. And it did kill the cells for about a week, and then the currents brought it back, and it was still there. And they had tons of copper in the water. So it was, yeah, and that's a, a lesson to learn in the 50s about trying to mitigate red tide. That being said, they do it with ozone now, especially with drinking water. That is a preferred method. It does kill the cells. It does detoxify the toxins, but it's very, very expensive. And if you see you get a red tide bloom in Florida, that's the entire west coast of Florida, it's prohibitively expensive. A lot of areas use clay, believe it or not. This is used in Asia a lot. On the left is a culture of red tide. And when you add clay, it actually sticks to the cells and carries them to the bottom. So you see the clear on the right, that's had clay added and it's taken the cells down. And they do this for aquaculture, then they just move the pens out of the red tide area and they can save the fish. The problem is it just moved everything to the bottom. So the bottom is impacted. 
and it resuspends too. One of the, my jobs in Florida was answering, I used to call them the Dear Jeb letters. And it was letters people would send to Jeb Bush on how to cure red tide. And there were some really good ones. One of them wanted to drop all the spare pennies everybody ever collected in the Gulf of Mexico. Copper would kill the red tide. One of them wanted to drain the Gulf entirely and replace the water. Um, one wanted to set up giant fans to mix the water so the cells would die. And the last one I got before I moved north was, I don't understand why you're not doing this. Everybody's doing biofuels. You just harvest it and make all these red tide cells into biofuels. And it's like, um, what do you do with the toxins? You know, what toxins? So this is a very, what I can say is it's an active area of research. There are people looking at the mechanisms that turn off the genes for toxin production. They're looking at changing the ratios of nutrients in coastal water to kind of push the species away from red tides. There's a whole variety of very creative scientists looking at this right now. And the question is, do we want to mitigate them? Some of these are huge. Collateral damage. Um, if you add literally tons of bleach, and the gentleman that patented bleach also patented a bleach spreading machine <laughs> that you put on a boat to spread the bleach to kill the red tide. And when we pointed out, you're probably killing a whole lot of other things. Um, didn't want to hear about it. Uh, and the cost. And, and in many cases, these blooms are very expensive, but they're even more expensive to mitigate. And then I just thought I'd end with the good news is that Maine and Florida actually do a very good job of monitoring the red tide. Um, they do have to close the, the shellfish beds down. Um, this is done essentially for human health. And the seafood that you get at a store is monitored and is perfectly good, not red tide to eat. Same with the fish. Um, it is a challenging job, but they do it very well. People still do get PSP and NSP poisoning. But as I said, it's largely the non-resident population, the transitory in Florida, or in Maine, a fisherman who's offshore who simply doesn't know that there's a red tide there. So it does still happen, but it doesn't happen uh, very frequently anymore because they're doing it. There haven't, hasn't been, a, I believe, a case of uh, mortality in Maine from a managed, or in Florida, from managed shellfish uh, for red tide since both programs were started. And I'll just end it there and say, if you're going to Alaska, talk to me after because you don't want to eat shellfish in Alaska right now. <laughs> they very bad red tides if people are getting sick. So that gives me 10 minutes for questions. We have a number of ponds and lakes that have algal blooms yeah. increasing. Are there identified toxic yeah. algae? Yeah, about 50% of those freshwater, but if you look and see green scum, about 50% are species that are toxic. Um, that's why we tell people to keep their, their the animals away from them. There are still incidences in the U.S. All those little green dots you saw in the states in the interior, those were blue-green blooms. They're primarily blue-green algae. Um, it's a real issue, it can be an issue in a little farm pond, but in the freshwater areas where they take drinking water from, that's a huge issue, and they have to monitor for this, because they have to deal with those toxins, you cannot have those toxins in drinking water. And uh, I think the worst case recently was in Brazil, they had a dialysis facility that would take the water from a freshwater, and they weren't aware that there was a toxic bloom. And I think they lost about 76 people on dialysis. And they didn't know right away. They had to go back and trace it and, and bring in people to look at it because they weren't monitoring for it. So they're aware of it now, and it is a huge freshwater problem. The nutrient issues are different because freshwater systems are generally phosphorus limited. Are there algae, are there toxic blooms in the Everglades? Within the Everglades themselves, no, but downstream in the Everglades there are in Florida Bay. If you're familiar, there's two of the main sloughs, yeah. the, the freshwater areas that come through the glades, Taylor and Shark Slough exit, yeah. Indu or in the vicinity. And there are a lot of, actually, nitrogen nutrients that come so in. All the drinking water coming to the East Coast cities is not affected? Um, it depends where they take it from. At Goosehatchee River, there's some issues. They have alluvian algae that are in Lake Okeechobee that get transported to Goosehatchee and out to St. Lucie. Downstream into Florida Bay, the issue is not a toxic algae per se, it's this light attenuation. There's a type that blooms that isn't toxic, but the water is this deep, and you put your hand in and you can't see this deep. It, it's so dense, and it blooms for years. 
and the problem is it wipes out sponges and seagrass. And, um, the causes of that are, they're still debating it. The last time it bloomed in 05 was when they uh, rebuilt the 20 mile stretch down to Key Largo and disturbed a lot of the adjacent mangroves, but they had hurricanes come through and that contributed. So Southern Florida is a pretty complex area to look at. You're not at a loss for different types of blooms all the time. Retiring. 
Um, a lot of people are doing molecular, so there's not a lot of people just looking at the cells, and some of these are very difficult to tell apart. So we were proposing a class to kind of train the new, new scientists out there, and Bigelow is a great place to do that because they have the U.S. culture collection. So if we can get that up and running, and writing a lot of proposals for a variety of projects right now. Thank you. Go to the next question. What's the half-life of sex toxin, and is it degraded by the shellfish, or because of the life? Um, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I believe it's a couple of weeks. However, it is re retained, don't quote me on that one, in the shellfish, they decorate it naturally. So if the cells are disappear from the water, the, the toxins will eventually be decorated out of the shellfish. They become non-toxic. That varies with the toxins. I know in Florida, it's usually three to four weeks where we'll go in and test. The red tide will disappear, and we know, that shell, we know that shellfish is still toxic. We will test it for the commercial shellfish ferment who are asking us, you know, is it toxic? And we say yes, and they say, we will prove it, and we do. But we know it's usually four or five weeks after the red tide is gone. So I'm a little less familiar with, with the main saxitoxin, so that's why I'm a little hesitant to give you an answer there. But so the principle is the same. The shellfish will keep it for a period of time. So, so the red tide enzymes to mm -hmm. degrade it? Yeah, degrade it and excrete it. It's a combination. And I can I can look that up if you want to follow up. But yeah, eventually the shellfish, it doesn't impact them and they will eventually get rid of it in the environment if they're not exposed anew. The problem is if they're continually exposed, you have a bloom. The longest time we had a bloom in Florida was twenty six months. It hung around. The shortest one was a month. So luckily in Maine they're they're shorter. They're generally May through late summer. And they think, if you look at the website here, actually, there's there's comments that they think they're coming to the end of it for this year. And they have gotten very good at predicting them. They map these cis beds, and they can model the currents. And you'll see the announcements early in the spring every year, whether it's going to be a good red tide year, see if there is such a thing, or a bad red tide year. <laughs>
We have measured the toxins, but they're generally in the parts of fish that people don't eat, um, like the livers and things like that. When you look at the white meat, usually there's no toxin in that. So if you look at the official websites, they say it's safe to eat fish. That being said, and a red tide with all these dead fish, you really don't want to eat the fish. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it is safe to eat the fish, but in some cases it's probably not the best thing in the world, not necessarily because of red tide, but a lot of dead fish around. We'll invite uh, those of you that still have questions to come in talk with uh, Dr. Heil, and uh, let's give her one more. So thank you for attending today. And once again, I'll remind you that we have these every week, same time, same place, um, and that there are some, uh, there's some literature and, and different things that you can take home with you to learn more about Bigelow Laboratories over here at the side desk and in the back, and uh, uh, encourage you to uh, sign the guest book. So thank you very much. Thank you.